Welcome, this is a little three-part series on making music for the Sega Genesis or the Sega Mega Drive, depending on what you want to call it, and focusing on a cartridge at the end as an output, so something you can play on real hardware. These machines are fantastic in the fact that they've got a very powerful FM synthesizer by Yamaha in them, and they've also got the Master System audio in. So you've got quite a lot of uh, control you can have over them, and uh, the songs you can make on these sound fantastic. It's going to be three parts. The first part will concentrate solely on programming instruments for these uh, machines. And then the second part will be tracking and using defil mask and all the different commands. And finally, we'll do a third part on the cartridges and actually making your own cartridge and assembling graphics and everything together so that you have effectively what's an album, like you can call it an album, I guess, on a cartridge. Uh, so I'm going to assume a little bit of music knowledge that you understand uh, the basics of electronic synthesis. And without further ado, let's jump into Defil Mask, which is available for free or by donation. And uh, let's get straight into it. So welcome to Defil Mask. And if we push the enter key, we get a very decidedly Genesis sounding track. And if we isolate each of these channels, here, there's a kick drum and a bass on that one. Hi-hat, tuned hi-hat on that one. Melody on this one. Some chords on this one. Ooh, they're flipping between different sounds as well. Snare drum on this one. And this is the Master System audio, which is back compatible. So you can hear here. That is the old Master System audio, which is playing at the same time as the Mega Drive. So we have all our FM Mega Drive uh, YM chip over here, and we have our uh, pulse generator uh, over here, which is from the master system. So there we go. That is the two systems in one, and if we push edit on any of these instruments, you'll see that they come up on the right-hand side of the screen. Now, if I push edit on this one, you'll see it's a different looking instrument, and that is because it belongs to the master system. Now, if I push the space bar, you can see it goes between red and gray. We want to be in the gray mode, because if we're in the red mode and we start typing on the keyboard, it'll start putting notes in. So we want to just be, without the space bar down, in gray mode, and then we can play and we can listen to what all these different sounds are. So this is the master system sound, and this here is also master system sound. So what's happening? Even though that's an FM instrument for the Mega Drive, if we have clicked on this master system part of the screen, it's going to play it back as a master system instrument, even though it's not. So you need to have clicked on any of the six tracks on this side of the screen. And then you can hear the Mega Drive goodness. Or the Sega Genesis goodness, depending uh, how you say it. Now, I also say Sega instead of Sega. It's just an English thing. All of these menu features make a lot of sense, but the one that may confuse you is this change system. And you can choose between a bunch of different systems, uh, but we are going to be using the Sega Genesis today. So just make sure that change system is on Sega Genesis. Okay, starting a new module. We are, you'll see that um, by default, everything's disappeared. So we would just push the edit key to get that instrument editor. Now the default instrument, if you start playing some notes, is this fairly generic sounding FM uh, instrument. So what we're gonna do to just reset everything is open this uh, little default program I've made. And you'll see that we start with a, a bit of a, a, a more reset uh, instrument configuration. So by default, this is silent. It makes no sound. And that is because all of the total level controls are turned to, well, 127, which represents quiet. So if we turn this one up, have a listen to that. I'm just using the keys on my keyboard, computer keyboard, to play some chords. Now I can put my uh, octave up and down. So if you scroll through all these algorithms, you'll see that they all represent different signal paths. And this signal path here represents one, two, three, and four, which are these four here, all outputting to the outside world. And you can see that because this is this little bit here is basically what's going uh, to your speakers. All of these other ones have other operators in the way. So one has two next to it, so it's not going to make any sound unless two's up. 
And for instance, this one here isn't going to make any sound. In fact, nothing's going to make a sound unless four is up. And this one here is you need a, like two and four will be a volume control. So it's it's quite complicated because there isn't a single volume control uh, for each of these oscillators. But we'll get into that as we go. And the most important thing is that we choose algorithm seven because this algorithm is not FM, it's actually additive synthesis with all of them adding together. So I'm just playing some chords on the keyboard. And if we turn this mult up and down, you can see that's our first control of the day. And that is an octave between zero, one, two, and then three is a fifth, and then four. And then we start getting into the wild kind of slightly atonal stuff. I wish there was a 16. Unfortunately, it only goes up to 15. But that's okay. We can deal with that. So, in order to get um, a bit of a different sound from this very generic sound here we can change the envelope of the way the sound is generated and if you've ever used a synthesizer this is the same adsr so you can hear there it's sloping up when i remove my fingers off the keyboard it stops pretty quick so if we put a bigger release you can hear the release there rings out when the note stops now you'll notice that these are all pretty high for something that ramps up pretty quick and that is because we have this um, ramp sensitivity control here and if we turn that back it doesn't change the picture but it very much changes the sound let's put something a little bit more uh, obvious on so we've got versus so this is really useful for when you're trying to build a uh, very staccato stabby notes and having it all the way to the left is helpful when you're trying to make nice sweeping soundscape sounds that sounds pretty good to me okay so we have a detune control here which slightly detunes it's only by about a cent so i think it's three cents up and down it's not much that is handy in fm mode though we'll look at that later and then we have up here a few other options AM and if we turn what's that doing let's have a listen let's turn the envelope up a bit can you hear that vibrato sounds like the old um, Rhodes keyboards we also have a frequency modulator which is like a modulation wheel on a keyboard Just adds a bit of modulation to the whole sound and then we have a feedback control and this only affects operator number one so as we turn this feedback up, you'll hear it goes into a very different sound. Now it's warbling at the moment because we've still got this AM control on. So I'll just take that off. And now you'll hear, as I turn my TL down, it has a similar effect as well. Not only does it get quieter, but it also loses the wrap effect that happens at the top of this setting. So this setting here is affected with your total level control as well. You'll hear when we turn that down, it stops being as feedbacky on itself. But this is a good way and you get noise. Haha, -ha, that'll come in handy later. So this is a good way of getting a slightly different sound only on operator one. And you'll see the operator one has this little loop back and that's on all of the algorithms as this little loop back. So very handy, and by default, you get a really dirty bass note out of it. In fact, if we put out that up, we get a sort of trombone sound or a really punchy bass. And it kind of pass filters as it drops off. But that is very touchy. And this is one of the settings that between emulation and the real hardware, that point where it jumps into noise is right on the edge of, um, uh, uh, right, uh, just right on the edge, depending which Mega Drive motherboard revision you've got and all sorts. So yeah, anyway, let's continue on. And we're gonna look at the very, very last control, which is the SSG EG. Now at the moment, I've got my I'll just make it a bit shorter. That's nice. Just sort of plays and stops. And 
what if we wanted to repeat this so that when it finished playing, it repeated? Well, we could turn on our SSEG, and you can hear there, we're effectively getting a repetitive sound. Now there are different modes that we can choose, and there are eight modes. Uh, let's put this down a little bit so we get a bit more wubby. And if we choose mode number one, it won't repeat, it'll just play once and then the attack will never, or the uh, release will never occur. It'll just move right out. And our second mode gives us our attack and then oscillates up and down. Our next mode <laughs> plays the amplifier and then at the point where it tapers out, it just puts it to full volume again. And then we've got one that ramps up in reverse, runs the envelope in reverse, and then we've got a ramp up and a hold. It's kind of almost uh, overriding the envelope. And then we've got my favorite, which is six, which is just running backwards and forth. So backwards and forwards through your envelope. And then finally, you've got one that ramps up and then kills audio. So you can imagine these are pretty helpful, uh, especially two and six. You can almost make an LFO out of these by using that, but you just got to be aware of how they operate. So, um, you know, this SG mode is, is a bit of a hidden gem uh, and is something that is very misunderstood. And if you're new to uh, Defle Mask, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a mystery, but if you're an old hat and you've never really known what it's done, this section has probably just blown your mind. Um, so it took me a while to figure out how it works. Okay, so this is channel two. So if we now go to channel two, you can hear, well, let's first of all copy what we've got on channel one, just so we've got a nice copy. And you'll hear that these are pretty much identical in sound. If we listen to the top one and this one here, the only difference is this one's an octave up. So if I put that an octave up, this one an octave up, get rid of the feedback, you'll hear that they'll both be the same thing. So if we now look at a stack of operators together, you can hear we've got operator one there, we can bring operator two in, operator three, and operator four. And here's the thing, this is a higher one because of the Malt 8, so we're going to turn the volume down because you'll find as stuff gets higher in pitch, it tends to get like a, a fair bit louder because um, it's just raw digital waveform. Okay, so here we go. All of that effort and we made a church organ. And you'd expect that because this is basically what a church organ is. It is uh, the first operator and then you've got a two and then you've got a four, then you've got an eight. And if you've ever looked at an old uh, keyboard, that's what those knobs basically do. Amazing. But what you can do is something which is uh, pretty cool which is you can do chords because you've also got this Malt 3. So if I play a single note, you can hear we're getting effectively two notes for the price of one. So you can do these little chord stacks and if you have a listen over here, Even though that's a fifth and we're playing effectively four uh, notes together, we're playing an octave and a low octave and a fifth and a fifth, um, it's just one note. And you put them together and you can get these really nice sort of jazzy chords. So there we go. That is purely using additive synthesis uh, with these four operators. And you can hear already we've got some pretty good sounds. So that is the additive algorithm, algorithm number seven. And the next we're going to look at is the two by two matrix. And for that, we're going to look first of all at what FM is.
Here we have a very simple synthesizer, and on it, a very simple sound. It's basically just a triangle wave. And if we add some modulation to it, that's one of the two wheels on the keyboard. You can hear what that's doing is waving the audio up and down in pitch. In fact, we can exaggerate that if we turn the amount up. If I turn the rate down, you'll hear it going there. And if we take that modulation of going up and down and we speed it up and up, we eventually hit something that sounds a bit like FM. Because it is FM. Now, interestingly, all the notes on the keyboard are going to sound pretty much the same pitch. What we need to do in order to make the notes so they're different is be able to change this rate so that every note of this rate shifts with the notes on the keyboard. And that is why when we're programming FM, we have what we call a multiplier, which is telling us uh, what the difference is between the original note and the note that we're going to generate with adding the modulation on top. And there it is. You can hear it right there. In fact, if we turn this one way down low, you can almost hear it just oscillating. There we go. You can hear the FM in that. So that is basically our... Um, Operator FM. We've just got a straight envelope which is playing, holding the note. So you just hit the note and it holds. And you can hear the way that it affects that second note there. And you'll notice now that this, this is our volume control, whether this changes the amount of FM. So at nothing, it'll just be this by itself. And as we add the operator underneath, it's going to bring octaves down, but modulating it up and down. What we can do is change the way this TL drops off over time, which is of course just using this. So let's, let's just do a simple uh, drop off. You can hear that classic FM sound. And this one's going to hold on forever, so we can make that so that it fades out as well. And you'll notice that this one here, in fact, if we crank this one up, this will affect the level because this operator, operator number one, is feeding into operator number two. So whatever you do in operator two is the absolute for the amplitude, so for the actual level dropping off over time. That's effectively our envelope for the whole sound. Whether this is more about how bright the sound is. That we can introduce the feedback and you'll hear that classic super bright you can now see why the first operator has the ability to change the shape because it really does shape the rest of the sounds in a really crazy way. This is your sort of uh, your primary operator for how you're going to stack the modulation uh, beyond that point. And you will hear if you swap these rounds, so for instance, if I have Molt 4 here and 0 there versus 4 here and 0 here, they will sound very, very different. So that is something definitely to take note of, uh, the order of which you do these. We're getting the instant classic FM sounds by doing this. You can change your staccato, you can hear how useful that is now for shaping your um, primary oscillator. 
So this is known as two operator FM or two op FM. And we've got another pair. So if we mute the top pair by turning the TL down, we can go to the bottom pair and we've got the second set of operators. Two more operators. Shape up a nice little sound there and add it. And that is an example of programming an FM sound from scratch. I mean, once you know what each of these do, I mean, you can sort of hear by just setting them, you know, in this configuration and having a listen to how they hold. Then you can start experimenting with tricks like, well, let's get this oscillator and this oscillator so they sound the same. And then we can detune one up and detune one down. Start getting flangey sort of sounds. Or we can start using that AM modulator on one of them. Bit of a wobble. Or we could say, let's put it into that mode six, which just oscillates between these. And you can hear we've got some pretty cool programming going on. We've got like these re-trigger, like going backwards and forth. We've got, you know, a, a second octave up with a, a, you know, totally different sound to the first sound. We're layering, you know, two sounds together. And yeah, this is really a fun operator to play with. I'd say a lot of my um, music is based around this algorithm four. But let's have a look at some of the other algorithms because of course that is just the start of it. Maybe just have a scroll through and have a listen. All right. So I've just reset the patch here and we're going to look at algorithm number one. And the reason we're going to look at algorithm one is because when Yamaha first made their FM chips into their early synthesizers, people like Quincy Jones and Herbie Hancock got hold of these instruments and went, wow, these have got great like piano-y sounds that we haven't really heard before. And they've got their own sort of unique style about uh, how they generate sounds, these FM chips. And this was a particularly popular algorithm uh, for very traditional sounds. Now, if we break it down technically and we look at it, what we've got here is operator number four, which if we turn up by itself, is just that sine wave. Might just multiply it. So there we go. We've got the sine wave, which doesn't matter which algorithm we use. It's gonna sound the same on each one because if you look, four is always going to the mixer by itself. But if we wanna start modulating four, we can then start the stack. So this here is gonna make our sound brighter. And in fact, if we make them both one, we end up with this semi sort of piano kind of sound. As it drops off, we'll just make this drop off as well. Now, if we start adding these operators together, so this is just the two operator FM that we looked at before. Uh, of course, if you flip these one way, it'll uh, act as a brightness, super bright tool. If you flip them the other way, kind of acts as an almost pass filter. So depending which way you flip these uh, is how they're gonna you know, affect each other. But generally, the higher you crank up the multiplier, the more metallic it sounds on top. So we're going to put it back to, we'll make it multiply a one and one. And then we're going to give this a little bit of brightness. So at the moment we're multiply zero, so it's almost adding more body to the sound. In fact, we could add that to both of them and detune them and get this nice sort of, yeah, I don't know what you'd call that, sort of flangey FM sound. But when we really crank these high and we just make them so that they are like little attack sounds, so they're sort of like a little shorter sound, you'll find 
it'll add this sort of metallic sound. Let's turn those down because they're cranked right up. And I've got a little sequence here. I'm just going to start playing because this will help me really program and listen to what I'm making at the moment. So we're going to make that ring out a little bit more. Maybe just hold the note. You can hear the brightness that comes up with putting the multiplier higher. We might detune those, get a little bit more variation in the sound. We could turn the feedback up, which on this first operator, if you remember, will make it a little bit more of a rounded off sine wave. And you can hear it sounding more like a um, FM synth vibe sound as I turn this operator 3 down. And what's happening is these two operators are feeding into number 3. So if we turn this one right off, it goes back to being a sine wave. So these are feeding into here. So it's a little bit of a game between getting this one at a nice setting and getting this one with your brightness. One quite interesting thing that you'll realize is that if you stack the multipliers so that they ratio uh, in a binary fashion, so they relate to each other as far as uh, they can be halved or doubled, uh, so we've got four, two, one, and zero, they'll give generally, if you've got the, the higher number on top, you'll get the brighter sound as it cascades through. So each layer adds its own sort of bit of brightness. If we start from the bottom. In fact, if we turn this final one up, you'll get an even bigger shimmer. You can also flip this and get some interesting combinations. So for instance, uh, in fact, if you just change this bottom multiplier, you'll be surprised, even though it's just a sine wave, how much it will change the rest of all of these cascading down. So it's more than just an octave shift. It's more of a high pass filter almost. And then here we could put this multiplier back down to zero sort of get some of that bass back. Sounds it's more of a clavitone. Really great sound. You can almost hear the hammer coming back off the string. And right at that moment, I was like, I've got to try writing something with this sound. Because you hear a sound, you go, I can do something with that. You can almost hear the hammer bashing back on that, like, pickup. You know, and you can change uh, the way this sounds, the brightness of it. I mean, how cool does that sound, you know? This is back to what I was saying. If you find a cool sound, save it, because you may never get it again. So that is now my new clavitone. So let's listen to some classics. This is ported from the DX7 synthesizer series. Classic piano. So you can hear what's happening there. I'm just swapping the sounds over. Um, this is one opportunity I will take to show you something that you can do with advanced programming. If I change all of these to instrument number five, there is something pretty crazy going on with this sound. If we have a listen. Now, if you can hear those echoes, they are actually built into the sound. What we're gonna do is have a look at how we're getting that echo. So what we've got is, if you remember these re-triggers um, that we're using, the SSEG, I'm using this, which is pattern number six, 
which is, as an LFO, is just going to be moving through this envelope back and forth. But it sounds like things are running backwards. And it's kind of like a little delay, but to get an actual delay of the pluck, which is coming from here, we're using mode number zero, which is just repeating the envelope. So it gets to the end of the envelope and then it repeats it again. So this is being repeated time and time again. And that'll give you the pluck, but the pluck will actually be softened by this operator as it's moving down in time. So you kind of get that tape delay effect uh, as, it, as it runs uh, through. And I can change the delay time by changing uh, the decay on this. So, or in fact, de decay two. That wild that's the kind of stuff you can do once you start understanding uh this this is a uh, an instrument that i am um, opening with off a uh, uh, release hopefully coming soon anyway i wanted to show you one last thing which is this <laughs> so what we've got here is two bass lines <laughs> playing together, but slightly out of tune with each other. So you can do things like stimulate chorus effects, but you actually do that, even though it's an instrument programming thing, you actually do that within your tracker. And I'm going to explain about how to do extra layers of chorus modulation and things like that when we get to the tracking section. So there is more instrument design to come, but it's at a tracking level. So that's just a little lead I made. So let's focus on this channel here, which at the moment is a DX piano, sounding a little bit uh, cheesy. Let's try to make this percussive. So it's got a bit of a hi-hat sort of sound to it, but we still want it to be pitched. What we can do is make this more of a pluck. So first we'll shape a nice little pluck sound. We got some nice little pluck sound. And if we get this First feedback, you'll notice I'm still in the same algorithm. I'm doing everything with this one algorithm because it's quite flexible. And we crank operator one up. And we turn this one down. Start to hear it getting noisy. And there's a certain point. See how it sounds in the mix. And the good thing about it is it still has a ring to it. Kind of like that. Of course, all we're missing now is a kick drum. So how do we make a kick? Well, let's start with a blank sound and we'll put um, a straight sine wave and we'll just get a nice low note. Whoa, hang on, we're gonna be clicked on our FM6 or whatever channel we wanna put the kick in. It's gonna be on channel one probably. Okay. Ooh, that's very low. That's a brown note. There we go. That's a nice sine wave there. And what we're going to do is slowly bring up our second operator. And what we're going to do is make that fall off happen really quick, but also with a lot of vigor. So we get a lot of this level. We'll turn the envelope speed up. So it's just going. You can hear it turn into a kick. We'll do the same with this, um, except we'll not push it as hard as that. It's going to be a little bit of extra kick. the real slap texture to it. Give it a real punch. So now we're going to replace this and we'll tune it because it is a tuned kick. We'll um, maybe put an octave down. Oh, how's that for dirty? Oh, we'll just chuck it on the one. Doom. Whoops, put that one in the wrong spot. 
And the good thing is it's knocking one of the um, bass notes out um, when the kick goes, so it's kind of a nice little side chain almost kind of thing. Might knock that note out as well, let the kick ring out a bit more. And then do oh, except that would be over this one too. Do do. Do 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 do. So there we go. You can start to see the approach to programming percussion as well. I could sit and go through every algorithm up here and explain what they do and how it works, but I think I've probably done enough to leave it here and maybe come back with some advanced classes later on. Um, that should hopefully give you the recipes for noise percussion, percussion where you're hitting a skin, which is this kind of programming. Should give you piano, should give you organ stacks and chord stacks. And really, if you look and explore all the other algorithms, they'll all have different uh, ways that they feed back into each other. Algorithm 5 is quite interesting. It's worth spending some time playing around with, maybe try to make an entire track just with Algorithm 5. That's on my to-do list. I haven't tried that yet. And if you make all your percussion, all your sounds, all your everything just using one algorithm and you make... Actually, that's a great idea for a release. I might do that. Is a release that is just each algorithm. It's eight tracks, Algorithm 0 to Algorithm 7. That's wild. Okay, don't steal my idea. You heard it here first. <laughs> and that would be such a good way of learning how to use these instruments. Anyway, I hope this has been a nice introduction to the sound programming. You can see I've already started to get into the tracking side and start to explain some of this, you know, detunes and things like that. So we will be revisiting some of the instrument programming when we do our tracking, which we're going to go into next and look at a bunch of tricks and just general tracking rules I guess that um, you can use to try to make your track sound bigger and fuller and more bangin'. Thank you, I've been Citrix and I look forward to talking to you again in part number two.